In the last episode, we've created our first full stack buffer overflow exploit by overriding the return pointer on the stack and jumping to shell code that we have placed on the stack as well. In this episode, we will look at stack level 6, which looks at what happens when you have restrictions on the return address. To understand this video, you must have understood how a normal buffer overflow and jumping to shellcode works. I hope I explained it well enough in the past videos, but if there are still open questions, please post them on Reddit. I really need you to have understood that stuff. As a hint, this level tells us that this level can be done in a couple of ways, such as finding the duplicate of the payload with object dump minus s, or red to libc, or even return oriented programming. In this video, we will not be able to explore return-oriented programming, but I will show you a couple of other tricks that will eventually lead to return-oriented programming. So let's have a look at the source code. And again, it's very similar to the previous levels, just some small changes. Instead of everything being in main, main calls this function getPath. getPath allocates a string buffer for 64 characters, then reads a string with gets, and we all know by now that with gets we can read arbitrarily many characters, which we can use to override the return point on the stack. But the next line is interesting. Built-in return address is a function from the compiler, which you can use to read the current return address from the stack. And this return address is checked if it starts with hex bf. The ampersand performs a bitwise and with the address. After that, only the part where they were same survives basically setting the remaining bits to zero, and checking if the front is still hex bf. If the return address starts with hex bf, it prints this return address and exits. When we use our exploit from last time and adjust the padding to account for the new unsigned int in this function, we see that it doesn't work. It fails with bzzt. Okay, so we cannot use addresses that start with hex bf. The exit protects this function from being exploited that way because the exit is a syscall that simply quits the program. So even though we have smashed the return pointer, this function will never return. So you can see that even having a buffer overflow doesn't necessarily mean you can exploit it. When we open this level now in GDB, break it get path, run it, and then look at the map memory with info proc map, we can see that the only address that starts with BF are on the stack. So basically we cannot return to a stack address. This is crazy. Then how can we run our code if we cannot return to the stack where we place our shellcode? So first of all, we can still control the return pointer, as long as it doesn't start with bf. And now comes the sick idea of returning into known code. Let's think about this. The return instruction just looks at the current address on top of the stack, removes it and just jumps there. What would happen if you return to the address hex 0804844f9, which is the return instruction itself. Think about this. We override the return pointer with hex 080, we reach the return instruction, it will pop this address from the stack and jump to it, basically just jumping to itself. And now it will read the next address on the stack and jump there. Now you could repeat that, make the next address on the stack again 080, or place the address of the stack here, and we can return into the stack again. And in theory that should work, because the original return address got overwritten with an address that starts with 080. Okay, let's try that. Let's modify our exploit code. Instead of the shell code, let's use int3 cc instruction again for a trap. We all know that when we hit them, we have code execution and we just have to find suitable shell code. So let's focus on the interesting part. Set a breakpoint at the return of get path, and then run it with our exploit input. We hit the breakpoint and we got past the return pointer check. So let's look at the stack. We can see that the address on top of the stack is now the 08 address, which is the return instruction. So now single step forward, this should pop this address from the stack and jump there. And indeed, we hit the breakpoint again because we jumped to itself. When you now look at the stack, the next address on the stack is the stack address and we will return into this address now. So when we just continue, we will return into the stack, like in the previous exploit where we hit our traps. Boom! Arbitrary code execution. By the way, 
This address we jump to, the 080, is a gadget. When you read about return-oriented programming, you are looking for gadgets. And that was a simple, no operation gadget. It was just a return doing nothing. And for full return-oriented programming, you look for gadgets that do uh, some more stuff before returning to the next address. Now when we do this kind of stuff, you hear me saying return into or jump to, those become equivalent in this case. Because yes, we execute a return instruction, but we are not returning to the original function anymore. We are returning into something else, effectively just jumping somewhere else. So I hope that doesn't confuse you. Maybe you ask yourself, why the hell was the stack executable in the first place? There's no valid reason why the stack should be executable. That's why there exists a general memory policy nowadays, write, XOR, execute. Basically it means never have a memory page that is writable and executable, because then an attacker cannot execute any shellcode that he was able to write in the process memory. So we would hope that today every modern system uses DEP, data execution prevention, and sets the NX bit, the non-executable bit, for memory pages like the stack. But reality is not so simple. Embedded devices are on the rise with the Internet of Things, and often they don't support features like that. Or modern programming languages like JavaScript use JIT, just-in-time compiler, so they have to compile code on the fly in memory when needed and execute that. So they need writable and executable memory regions. But even if we had DEP, we could use techniques like red to libc to never execute actual shellcode but still a bonus system. Now one of the hints said you could look into red to libc. Now that you are almost a pro in exploitation, you understand what that means. It's very similar to what we did in stack level 4. Return into libc. Like we just returned into some code, we could just return into the huge library libc. There must be something interesting that we could abuse. One interesting function from libc is system, which executes a shell command. With print system we can find the address of it. But simply returning into it will probably not work. We need to make sure to control a couple of things. Let's create a simple C program that calls the libc system for us. In the end we want to somehow execute system with bin sh, because then we get a shell. If we try that here, that works well. Now let's look at this in gdb. We can see that before the call to system, the address of the command we want to execute is put on top of the stack. And as we know, a call to a function will push the return address on the stack as well. So if we draw this, this is how the stack will look like once we are at the start of system. First the address of the command is placed on the stack, and then the address we want to return to. Now imagine if we use our buffer overflow to return into a system, First of all, we didn't execute the call instruction, thus there was no return address pushed, but we fully controlled the stack. So system expects the stack to look like this, and we can build this by hand. So first we have to put the return address for system on the stack, but actually we don't care about this right now. But that's still cool and important and remember that, because you can chain those things together. Like we chained two returns after each other before, we could chain multiple function calls or other gadgets after each other by always controlling the return pointer of the next step. So in our case, when system finishes, we will return into a stack fault because it will return into 4141441. So next address on the stack has to be a string we want to execute, preferably bin sh. There are many options how to get a reference to such a string. One option would be to use a stack address because there are strings we control on environment variables because they are at the bottom of the stack and a bit easier to predict. But as you remember, the stack is a bit unreliable. A more reliable technique is this here. We can use find to search in the map memory of libc for a string. Cool, apparently at this address we can find bin sh. Let's check if that is true. Examine memory as a string at this address. What the frack gdb? What the hell are you doing? Why do you say you found bin sh there if it's not there? I have no idea why this is happening. Couldn't find anything online. Anyway, ignore this. Here's another technique. We can use string to find all strings in libc. And with minus t we can print the offset inside this file as hex. And then we can simply add this offset to the address libc is loaded to. 
and that is the real address of binsh. Okay, so let's copy this address into our exploit and then let's try it. Remember to use the trick from the previous video with the parentheses and the cat, because the exploit script will close the input again. And cool, it works! What we just did was the technique called read to libc, and we never executed any code on the stack.